This is a brief overview of Coming Soon, film posters from the Dwight M. Cleveland Collection, open at the Norton Museum of Art in West Palm Beach, Florida from July 12th through October 29th, summer of 2019. The outer gallery explains the landscape of posters. One area looks at different printing techniques and explains the transition from color lithography using stone through offset lithography using metal plates that held more detail, including silk screening to produce color images, how photography and the limits on reproducing photography steered decisions, the ability to tint those photographs by hand and by running them through the press repeatedly, and then finally the development of printing techniques that allowed color photographs to be reproduced on large posters. And the collection helps explain how artists had to think about creating their images differently to match and celebrate and make use of those printing techniques. There's a zone that shows multiple posters made for the same movie, which is Hollywood's effort to attract a diverse audience and get people interested in romance and people interested in comedy going to the same movie. Across the gallery is an assortment of different sizes investigating how Hollywood developed different size posters for different advertising environments, from desktop or countertop small lobby cards to large outdoor posters and how the printing techniques differed based on the expected distance the audience would be from the image. There's a zone called Anatomy of a Poster, which investigates all of the different standards that were applied to posters, from top billing for the star to secondary billing for the co-stars, having a group scene or a view, where some of the printing techniques show their registration marks and crop marks, and how all of those decisions and requirements ended up really constraining the design of a poster and contributing to a standardized approach. The Cleveland Collection also includes over 1,200 glass slides. These are small four-inch glass slides with a black and white image that was hand-colored with a zone at the bottom to write information about when a movie was coming to a theater, and they were projected using a lantern projector while the main projector was having its reel swapped during a feature, and they were the best tool for theater owners to let people know what was coming up because movies would only play for a day or two days and it was important to keep people informed about the upcoming features. The first zone inside the main area of the exhibition talks about collecting movie posters. It includes three posters that have really good origin stories about how they entered the collection and this area helps visitors understand the importance of ephemera collections in preserving these objects that are becoming ever more historically important but were originally created to be used very briefly and then discarded. Around the perimeter of the main gallery is a linear chronological narrative of the development of Hollywood, Hollywood movies, and the movie poster. The very earliest movie posters had to explain the basic concept of a movie to moviegoers. What would they be seeing when they got into the theater? What would the experience be like? And then studios realized very quickly that the posters had to do more than that. They had to sell the narrative that was on view. They had to augment it by using color. The posters for early silent films end up being exponentially more exciting visually than the actual movies. So we also have a screen showing some of the films with corresponding posters to help people see the difference between the actual film and the poster. Hollywood realized very quickly that audiences were interested in the people in the movies. This was the beginning of the cult of celebrity, and the posters developed to help promote the main celebrity with a kind of poster called Name Face Title, with the celebrity's recognizable face, their name, and the title of the movie. If there's more, it's so small that you might as well just ignore it. The rest of this wall investigates the development of that cult of celebrity and how we started to focus not only on who the celebrity was in the movie, but who the celebrity was out in the world and how that was brought into the movie. And the maturing of this cult of celebrity from the early teens all the way through the 1940s and 50s is one of the main threads in movie poster design. By the 1930s, the golden era of Hollywood, movie makers and studios had figured out the relationship between the stars, the celebrities, the audience, the filmmaking, and how the poster would celebrate that union and really promote the films. As a result of the perfecting of that equation, American movies met with tremendous success, not only in America, but throughout the world. The Cleveland Collection is rich with examples of posters from foreign countries for American-made films. 
The area includes posters from around the world, France, Germany, Japan. Wherever possible, we've included thumbnails of the original American poster so that visitors can appreciate the pretty wide distance between what an American studio thought was worth promoting or needed to be promoted and how the movie was received overseas. A great example is Casablanca, which was imagined to be a, just another B-movie in America. So the poster is, uses the newspaper clipping style to get the word out. By the time the movie reached Italy, it was such a sensation that the artist had an opportunity to completely reimagine the poster and really feature the romance, which turned out to be the exciting part of that film. There's a global comparison zone where we have multiple posters for the same movies, and you can see the sometimes pretty startling difference between how a movie or its narrative was promoted to match the culture of the country it was traveling to. Poland is especially famous for its posters. There was a rich tradition of poster making in Poland that naturally supported reinterpreting Hollywood movies when they traveled behind the Iron Curtain. The difference between the American Sunset Boulevard poster and the Polish Sunset Boulevard poster is pretty remarkable. The other posters for things like Dirty Dancing and Midnight Cowboy are equally alien when compared to their original American posters. The development of Hollywood and the, and the movie poster continue down the long wall of the gallery in a zone that looks at all the different ways Hollywood had to fend off the attacks that technology and progress threw at it. One section looks at sound. With the development of the public radio broadcast and radio dramas, there was less incentive to go out to a theater and pay money to see a silent film. So Hollywood had to race to get sound attached to movies, which of course also led to the movie musical, the ultimate triumph of the golden age of Hollywood. When television was on the horizon in the 1940s, it was clear that Hollywood was going to have to fight that off as well. Television was a small screen in the home and black and white, so adding color to movies was an obvious first step, and that took a while to figure out the technology, but the movie posters helped celebrate the addition of color. Another response to television involves the development of alternative types of movies, science fiction, teenage rebellion, things that you wouldn't be able to see at home on your television. There's a zone that investigates the Hayes Code and looks at how it affected morality in movies with examples of posters from before the code with racy pre-code movies to during the code where things were a little more controlled to the eventual downfall of, of that and the triumph of Hollywood looking at alternative behavior patterns and morality and how that's expressed in posters. And then there are a number of separate zones that aren't part of the bigger narrative because there are a number of other stories to include. One is the triumph of Paramount and MGM. Both of those studios had a healthier culture of art direction and a savvier approach to poster making that's really evident when you look at their lobby cards. The Paramount cards are so vivid and bold that they deserve to have their own area. Most of the posters in the show are made by now forgotten, unknown, anonymous artists. That's the blessing and the curse of being a contract commercial artist. But there are some people who either became famous through their poster art or were famous and dabbled in Hollywood poster art. And they've been pulled out into a separate section with people like Vargas and Hap Hadley and Al Hirschfeld. And contrasting that is an area of completely unknown artists creating images that are so striking and successful and exciting that they deserve to be featured and remembered even if the names of the people who produce them are not. The exhibition contains a separate wall for foreign films, movies made in other countries that when imported to America needed posters that help explain in hindsight how we felt about foreign film. We have a wall looking at diversity on screen and poking at what a long, difficult struggle it's been to try and get that equation balanced correctly. We have a wall of westerns. And there's also a wall with posters promoting screenings that will be happening at the museum. The exhibition has over 215 posters, and you could visit for 15 minutes or you could visit for two weeks. There are almost 22,000 words of labels that describe the posters, the printing techniques, the celebrities, the movies, the culture they were produced by and for, and the labels are written in a way that you can dip into them where you want to without reading all the way through. The exhibition runs through October 29th, 2019.
If you're traveling to West Palm Beach, go see it.